Hello, everyone. Uh, it's 6 30, so we'll get started. I believe we have enough people for a quorum. Uh, my name is James Jennison. I'm the chair of the Barrington Planning Board. Uh, and as chair of the Barrington Planning Board, due to the COVID 19 coronavirus crisis, and in accordance with the governance. Oh, I'm sorry, Marjorie, do you have the uh, recorder on for a ramble? I have it on. Okay, thank you. Uh, in accordance with Governor Sununu's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this board is, is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to the meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the Governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, this is to confirm that we are usually utilizing Microsoft Team for this electronic meeting. <clears throat> All members of the board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through Microsoft Team, and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and, if necessary, participate in the meeting through dialing 603-664-0240 or the conference ID on the agenda. Um, <clears throat> we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, again, my name is James Jennison. Um, Jeff Brand. Present. Andy Knapp. No Knapp. Ron Allard. Allard present. Uh, you're a little quiet for me, Ron. Um, I don't know if it's just me, but I'll let you know. Uh, Candace Kranz. Kranz present. Uh, Buddy Hackett. Present. And uh, one, two, three, four, five. So we have a quorum. Uh, I'd like to welcome the two Jamie? new members. Uh, pardon me? Yeah, Jamie, uh, what about Steve Diamond? Uh, Steve, um, there was a uh, interruption in service based on uh, seat yeah. assignments and select board voting to assign seats. So he was um, inadvertently lost his seat for a moment and now he has to be recertified um, and it couldn't happen till uh, Monday's meeting. Okay, um, just ask. And him. so, yeah, so he, he, he could have attended in, in, and I don't know, Steve, are you out there by chance? He said he wasn't gonna be, but um, I, I anticipate he'll be back next meeting. <clears throat> um, and before I get ahead of myself, um, we also have um, the town plan of Marsha Gassis, as well as uh, land use administrative assistant, Barbara Irvine. Um, first, I want to welcome the new members, Candace Kranz and Buddy Hackett. Thank you for joining us. Um, and Thank you. <clears throat> first on the agenda is the minutes, but we'll put those to the end so we can get to business. Um, and we'll start in with number two, uh, Barrington Shores LLC. And I believe, um, oops, sorry, Mr. Worth, uh, are you here? Good Mr. evening. Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Gregory Worth. I represent the applicant Barrington Shores LLC. Uh, we're here to, uh, we've, been, we've cleaned up some of the details. Now we're down to many issues associated with drain, drainage analysis and the like. Uh, but for the purpose of the new members, I will uh, do a little bit more history than I ordinarily would. This property is located at 7 Barrington Shores Drive. It's tax map 121, lot 28. It's just under 25 acres, commonly referred to as the Barrington Shores Campground. Currently has about 148 campsites and eight cabins. It also includes an office building, a workshop, recreation hall, bathhouses, leach field, camp roads, two beaches, boat docks, and playground and game areas. The zone is general residential with the Swains Lake Water Management Zone overlay. And it is a and it's pre-existing non-conforming campground. It's been there for approximately 40 years. One of the important factors that we need to keep in mind as I go through this, we discuss some of these issues, is that this is a seasonal campground. It is only open uh, about half the year, a little bit less. Uh, for example, the, the formal season that they have this year is between May 7th and September 26th. The project application was filed March 7, 2020. What the, the Barrington Shores was requesting uh, as revised is 24 new sites, uh, including gravel roads, drainage, septic, water, and utility service to the campsites. Zoning requires a minimum of 1,000 square feet per camping site. The application was accepted as complete April 7th. 
one of the things requested was a waiver with respect to the 100 foot um, setback from the boundary line that was addressed at the December 1 meeting and approved by the planning board. Um, that uh, waiver has been uh, implemented into the plans such that there's a 50 foot buffer uh, on the east an 80 foot uh, buffer with the exception of the northeast corner, which has a 100 foot buffer. And that's shown on the November 18th, 2020 plan. Also at the December 1 meeting, the conditional use permit was approved with the adoption of the modified boat inspections and an acceptable letter from the Swains Lake Village Water District. Um, with respect to that letter, we requested that of the Water District and obtained it. We have provided to the board, uh, the report is called an assessment of production wells number six and seven. It's dated October 28, 2020, and it was prepared by Emory and Garrett Groundwater Investigations, a division of GZ, uh, GSA. The assessment provides in part, and I'm going to quote, there is no reason to suspect that the bedrock aquifer is less capable of supplying groundwater or that you are running out of water, end quote. The assessment goes on to indicate that the submersible pumps in both wells are marginally sufficient and that it is important to note that currently there is no evidence that the aquifer is losing yield capacity despite the continuing drought conditions. We have to keep in mind that this report was done last year. That follows up on the email that we had obtained from Adam Kohler of the uh, district, indicating that they had enough water in the aquifer. And as he said, that was good news. So as indicated, the board requested that we obtained it and have provided it to the board. And you have a complete copy of the report as provided to us. As referenced at that December 1 meeting, we submitted drainage analysis documentation to Du Bois and King. Du Bois and King submitted a response February 22. I believe it's dated 2020. It was actually 2021. Uh, Tobin Farwell, uh, the engineer for Barrington Shores, has provided a response to Du Bois and King dated March 25, 2021. You should have a copy of that as well. That responded to Du Bois and King on a point by point basis. Uh, I'm only going to review several of the of the points that require um, uh, addressing at this point in time. Many of the issues were typographical errors, things like that, minor things that that were corrected or addressed uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, first point is a waiver has been requested with respect to Article 4.7.71 of the site plan review regulations which require the minimum allowable diameter in any storm drain, drain, drain system to be 15 inches. Barrington Shores proposed a 12 inch diameter site for the outlet of the det detention basis, basin. Sorry. Du Bois and King has provided a response to that waiver request and I'll quote their response. If the applicant is committed to ongoing inspection and maintenance and adequately maintains the drainage system to prevent clogging, we do not anticipate an adverse effect on the proposed drainage system or the use of the site and take no exception to this waiver. Point two addresses the requirement that there be 36 inches of cover over the storm drains the plan proposes that it meet the requirement of 36 inches of cover on the storm drains that are within the roads. The storm drains that are on the cross country runs will not have 36 inches of cover, which is why uh, Barrington Shores is requesting a waiver. We've gone over that issue with Du Bois and King, and they have also indicated that they take no exception to that with respect to the cross country runs, because there will be no vehicular um, uh, traffic on top of that. And there's no uh, uh, formal necessity for a 36 inch cover on the cross country runs. Thirdly, and probably the, the, the most 
important point that Dubois and King raised was point 15 regarding drainage analysis. They recommended that the applicant provide water quality treatment facilities, both pre-treatment and treatment, that meet the requirements of DES standards, which would be AOT standards, in accordance with the Town of Barrington Site Plan Review Regulation, Section 4.7.210. Over the last month or more, Mr. Farwell has had several discussions with Dubois and King on the point, both from the perspective of what is actually required under the standards and what is recommended, given the fact that this project that Barrington Shores has before the board tonight sir, uh, uh, addresses approximately 80,000 square feet of space and the AOT floor is 100,000 square feet. So our position is that we don't fall under that requirement. That being said, we have had, uh, as I said, several discussions with Du Bois and King talking about both pre-treatment and treatment because we're going to do it anyways. The issue has been, given the limited space, we had proposed the use of a stormwater filtration system utilizing a shade concrete, what's called a V2B1, in lieu of a sedimentation four bay in light of that limited space. As to the general system, the catch basins can be monitored and cleaned regularly and will be in order to maintain effective pretreatment. The, the, the drainage system includes a detention basin. Farrington Shores is of the belief that this meets the spirit and intent of the regulations without any further action, although as I've indicated, we're gonna take further action anyway. Our discussions with Dubois and King have, have come to a general understanding I'm sorry, in our discussion with Dubois and King have come to a general understanding that what we have proposed, the stormwater filtration system utilizing the Shea Concrete V2B1 is an, an acceptable alternative. Because of that, we've submitted the waiver of site plan review regulation, uh, section 4.7.210, uh, to propose that the sedimentation trap in the form of the V2B1 by shade concrete be utilized in lieu of the sedimentation four bay. Those details have been provided to the board. There are several things, several follow-up issues that Dubois and King has requested, many included in their letter of April 2, which we received uh, at the end of last week. The first requested that we provide standard AOT stormwater quality volume worksheet calculations that show that the adequate sizing of the pre uh, and show the adequate sizing of the pretreatment and pre and treatment proposed. We will be providing that with Dubois and King. Mr. Farwell had a discussion with them today to go over these things. The second point was uh, they wanted us to specifically identify the proposed size of the V2B1 filtration device to confirm that it meets the water quality sizing requirements. That again was discussed with Du Bois and King today. We have a general understanding that what we're doing is acceptable. The third point was pit information to confirm that the proposed storage is above the seasonal high water table. The test pit was completed yesterday and those calculations, those results have been provided to Du Bois and King and discussed with them. The next, uh, Dubois and King had, had recommended that the uh, side slope design, which was at two foot high to one foot, or two foot uh, against one foot, be modified to two and a half foot to one or flatter. Mr. Farwell had discussions with Dubois and King today, and Dubois and King finds the two to one as it is currently uh, um, spec acceptable based on uh, everything, all the results that we have. Next was a correct outlet, uh, to correct the outlet elevation of the emergency spillway throughout the plan set, that will be done. And last was to provide the riprap outlet sizing calculations. Again, that will be done. Just in terms of, of finishing up uh, the outstanding issues, there is a request for a waiver on lighting under uh, section 4.12 uh, with regard to outdoor lighting. Uh, obviously, this is a campground. 
Uh, there is existing lighting in the office area and the public settings, although in a campground setting, lighting uh, is not necessarily uh, desired. Um, people use flashlights, headlamps, lights on campers, things like that, but you don't want um, you don't want the campground looking like New York City. Um, so we have requested a waiver of Article 412. Um, just a, a, again, generally, and, and primarily for, for the uh, new members of the board, um, the requirement is 1,000 square feet per site. Uh, the smallest site that we are proposing is 1,360 square feet. The largest site is a little over 2,300. Um, there are uh, the number of sites, as I said, have been reduced to 24, um, and it, this is seasonal use only. So in terms of all of that, um, and, and in a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Farwell just so he can uh, get a little more specificity as to where he is with Du Bois and King. But we do have the four waivers, one on lighting, one on the 12 inch uh, diameter store and drainage system, one on the 36 inches of cover and the other on the, the water quality treatment facilities. And other than that, the only thing that is left is just final approval of the uh, uh, site plan review application. So with that, what I'd like to do is turn it over for a few minutes to Mr. Farwell to address where he is with Du Bois and King primarily with their discussions today. And we, we will take obviously any questions that the board has uh, because now we're down to uh, many details that, that uh, probably uh, generate some discussion. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Worth. Uh, real quick before Mr. Farwell, you get started, I just want to recognize that Andy Knapp has joined us and um, a verbal um, acknowledgement that you're here, Andy, for the record. Sorry, I was unmuting. I'm here. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, Mr. Farwell, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, so we're down to to drainage discussion with uh, Dubois and King and, and the town regulations. Yes, they, they require us to follow the AOT guidelines uh, or the AOT uh, regulations, uh, which require pretreatment as well as treatment. Uh, so what we are proposing or what is proposed for the treatment pretreatment of this system is um, deep sump catch basins. So that is our pretreatment method in order to follow the AOT requirements, those have to be four feet deep, uh, the sumps of the catch basins, therefore the depth below the inverts of the pipe. Uh, so we are providing that and therefore meeting AOT requirements for pretreatment. And then moving on to treatment facilities, we are proposing an infiltration uh, detention basin, uh, which requires a, a sedimentation four bay. And that uh, that requires typically about a third of the size of the detention basin be added on to the to the basin. So we are between a building and a wetlands, uh, and so we're a little cramped for space. Um, an AOT does, you know, if you apply for an AOT permit, uh, they do grant waivers for proprietary methods <laughs> of filtration. Which, which that's what the v Shea uh, V2B1, it's a swirl concentrator. So it uh, flow enters, swirls around, the sedimentation drops out into another catch basin, uh, which will be vacuumed out and maintained. Then it continues on into the detention basin. Um, the detention basin, Dubois and King also wanted to make sure that we had at least one foot of separation to the seasonal high water table. So we went out there and we did do a test pit. And based on the average uh, grade out there, we do have over a foot of separation to the seasonal high water table. Uh, so realizing that we were coming close uh, to what a, what Dubois and King wanted, uh, I talked with Dubois and King and, and gave them then that information preliminarily and wanted to, you know, make sure that we had our ducks in a row in that. Uh, and Dubois and King couldn't obviously provide an approval letter until everything was submitted, but I feel confident enough that nothing is going to really change uh, with regard to the plan too much. Sure, in, uh, the orifice out of the detention basin might move a little bit, but uh, nothing nothing of any significance is really going to be changed and, and uh, we will get a clear letter from Dubois and King uh, from them so we feel that uh, technically uh, regarding drainage that we have we will meet the requirements of the town regulations uh, 
Tobin, if I could ask a question, it, it, is the uh, con Shea Concrete uh, sedimentation trap, is is that reflected on the plans? Like on yes, D2? it is. Uh, is that on D2? On, on D2? Oh, the actually, um, is it D2 or D3? I thought I created a new detail sheet. Um uh, Pull it open. Yeah, it's shown on D3, the detail sheet D3. Okay. Uh, so that's the one that shows the flow. It appears to be two chambers with a baffle wall in it. Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, did Tobin, did you have any other things to add before we open up the questions? Um, no, I guess uh, I feel that we can get the clean letter from Dubois and King, so I think we've uh, wrapped up. And as if there's any questions regarding our waiver, I just wanted to hope I, I made myself clear, uh, and Gregory certainly did a good job explaining why we need that waiver. All right, uh, Jeff or anyone else, do you have any more questions um, regarding? Uh, anything at this point, really, I guess. I, I, I just got a question just to review the bidding based on what I heard. So with respect to this waiver on the sedimentation bay, uh, which has now been added, <laughs> the, the uh, concrete structure that's been added on D3, we're still waiting on Dubois and King to give us an answer, correct? What do you mean by an answer? It a, a response. You you have proposed this, but we don't have the formal response from Dubois and King yet that says, okay, this is an acceptable alternative to what they have proposed or what they commented on. I guess in my discussions, it, it is clear that Dubois and King is accepting our, our optional. They just want everything cleared up. Uh, mainly the separation to the seasonal high water table and the calculation worksheets showing that it is acceptable. Um, yeah, in, in, in some of the other cases, Dubois and King has been, you know, they've said, yeah, well, they don't have any objection to a waiver, but th they haven't given us, they haven't provided you with anything in writing yet that says, yes, we, 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 we get it and this is acceptable. Uh, I have received an email uh, explaining our our option, and that they said in they are in support of what we're proposing. Thanks, Shane. Yeah, I believe in their in their April second letter, they do indicate that the Shea Concrete B two B one is an acceptable alternative to the sediment four bay. So I believe what they're doing is indicating that it's an acceptable alternative. They just want to get our calculations to verify. That the sizing is correct. I apologize. Okay. Uh, so, did someone, I think, had their hand up, and I, I might have put it down yeah. by accident. Someone nope, waiting. And that yeah. was Ray. That was Ray. I, I, I put it down because he was talking. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that if you want any of these drawings put up on the screen, um, I can share them at any point here. All right. Yeah. If anybody needs that added, just speak up, and um, I think we're. I've got everything in front of me. Um, I, Mr. Worth, uh, Tobin, I, I believe the intent tonight is to hold off on 472 parents 10 on, until we have um, confirmation on the test pit analysis from Dubois and King. And I think we're prepared to move on the other waivers, but I think that was um, the intent. Um, is that correct, Marsha? Correct. I believe there was two that we should... The one was the lighting, the other one um, coverage and coverage over the pipe and pipe size, right? Is yeah. that the other one? There's four, right? Yeah, and then I think the other two we needed to wait. Um, I have a question. Can you folks see the plan set? Yes, yes. Okay, do you want me to take that down though if or you, if you don't need it now? or yeah, either way, i'm I'm good with it. Um, okay. Good without it. Um, any other questions from the board? Um. Yeah, this is Ron, Ron Allard. I, the letter from the um, 
the water district or the water district engineering company, it really didn't speak to any increase in load in, for the, to the system. It just said we could get it back to where it was. I think we were looking for actual confirmation that additional load would, would be not an issue for the water district. Uh, Mr. Worth, you have a... At the, at the December meeting, we had talked about the fact that the water district had had a report prepared, and that was the, uh, that was the, the basis for uh, Mr. Kohler's uh, reference that they were not running out of water in his email was provided to the board. The board asked for a copy of that report, uh, asked me to request uh, uh, of the district a copy of that report, which is what I did and provided it to the board. Um, I do not believe they have done a separate analysis. I'm not, I don't, I'm not the sure. The other thing I want to bring up to folks, because we've been through this before, yeah. the water, the supply of water is the responsibility of the district. It is just like any other water supply, public water supply. It is not the responsibility of the town of Barrington or the planning board. Okay, I just, it keeps getting brought up, but it is not our responsibility. You have a water district that is the water supplier for the town, for the, for the um, project. They provide, provide water to an entire area of town. It is their responsibility to take care of the, the water supply. Part of our, our purview though, Marsha, is to make sure that there's appropriate utilities for any new addition. And, and the responsibility is the water district. I think we keep going well, beyond no, that. I, I, and I think it's a, I, I think it's a it's fair question. It's a fair question, question I, but I just, yeah. we keep, it keeps coming up sure. and the water district is the responsible party. Yeah, and I agree with you, Marsha, and I think, Ron, I think from our role in, we've, they've been informed that this project is going on. They're not, not informed. So I think from, from that point, Marsh's perspective, they know, and if they had um, reasons to believe they couldn't provide water and had some objection to it, they would and should be here um, for such a for such a case. Um, I think that's the perspective Marsh is taking. Um, I, I, I understand that. That's different from what we had said in the past. We said we wanted a letter saying that they said they could handle the additional load. This is a this is a change in direction. Yes, I, d I don't disagree with that either. We had asked uh, for um, clarification that they were on board with supplying more water, I guess. Um, all right, any other questions? I have a couple of quick questions. Actually, one quick question on the fence. On the fence, they show the the fence kind of going down, not section by section, but sort of at an angle following the contours. Is that what you're going to do, or are you going to step it down section by section? And also on the fence, you have a uh, symbol there for the fence, but it's not on the legend. That always aggravates me. <laughs> um, Ray, maybe that's a question for you on the fence, how the fence is going to be erected. I think we covered this last time, but it's been a while. Yeah, I'm, I'm having a really hard time um, hearing what he's asking, but from what I recall, the conversation was the fence was going to be six foot in height at the top of the knoll. And then as it started to progress down, it was go, going to go to a height of eight feet. And then it was going to basically maintain the eight foot height the remainder of the way. So it would kind of, it would step a little bit as it, you know, goes down the, uh, the slope. And I think that was the question. Is it going to step or is it going to slope the top? I mean, I, On not, five, it looks like it's going to slope. Yeah. I think the intent is to slope, right? They set the posts and they, yeah. they, uh, the panels are not, uh, perfectly level, they match the ground rather than perfectly level. Does that answer your question, question Ron? Um, Candace and Buddy, do you have any clarification you'd like? Or I want to thank um, 
Gregory and Tobin for all of the background. I do appreciate that as a new member. The questions that I had primarily were about the divorce and King letter on April 2nd, which um, were addressed based on um, what they said, including the test pits being completed yesterday. So I have no further questions. Um, well, let's uh, before we vote on the waivers, let's uh, open public comment, see uh, what questions we have out there. Uh, if you're on the phone, it's star six to unmute. You can raise your hand, type a comment in the comment section or uh, respectfully speak up and I'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Jamie, uh, yes. a, a question of order here is so <clears throat> should can people provide public comment on all the waivers or should we take them one at a time and open it up? Um, there's four to address. Um, I'd like to keep the topic to those four. I think um, I think the, so I guess the question is, are we opening public comment for all? We've already said one of them we're not going to address. So right. are we opening public comment on all three or are we going to take them one at a time? I, I would like to do all three and try and knock them out because I don't think they're very different. Okay. I mean, other than lighting and drainage, really, that it kind of but they're not big ones in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, just just asking so that the people commenting know we're opening the floor for all three. Thank you. Yes. Um, do we have a any questions, comments? You might want to remind people how to unmute their phones. Uh, yes, star six to unmute if you're on the phone and uh, click the little microphone icon if you're on your computer. Um, as well as you can type a message into the chat. Jamie, just so you know, I was just uh, admitting another person to the meeting. All right. Does that person have any questions or comments before I close public um, the public comment? Not at this time. Thank you. Uh, hearing no other questions or seeing any hands, I'm going to close public comment. <clears throat> and um, We'll address the waivers. Uh, we'll start with the first one, four, seven, seven, parents, three. Um, that is the minimum coverage above uh, a drain pipe. If I'm correct here, I don't have it written down. Um, and it, it, it requires 36 inches, which we've discussed. Uh, they're not on travel lanes and um, doesn't appear to be an issue. Um, do we have any comments or questions on that? If not, a motion. I will make a motion <coughs> to uh, to waive requirement Article Four Point Seven Point Seven Parents One on minimum uh, storm drain pipe diameter for the application from Barrington Shores LLC as not doing so, not granting the waiver would pose an unnecessary hardship to the applicant and granting the waiver would not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulations. Second. I have a motion by Jeff Brand, seconded by Ron Allard. I just want to clarify that that is parents three and not parents one. Um, Jeff, would you concur? Uh, <laughs> I, I can look it up. I, I was working off of the planner's notes that said it was one. Yes, so it, it is 4771. Okay, is I've the got pipe diameter. Yeah, I, I, I thought you were starting off with talking about the cover over the pipe. <laughs> yes, uh, that's what I, I was talking about cover over the pipe, which is, which is three. Okay, that is three, correct. Is that what you were talking about, Jeff? Does it matter? We can do. Oh, you muted. No, in fact, I was talking about the request for the waiver on the 15 inch pipe. Okay, so, well, let's do that one then. We got a motion got and a second. Um, roll call vote. Uh, Andy Knapp. Hold on. Are we? I just want to make sure we're confirming the right 
number on this because we were on just talking about one and then switched to another and now we're back to we one. are so I'm gonna make sure I'm I, voting I will on the clarify right. we are approving a waiver for four seven seven parents one minimum allowable diameter in a storm drain system shall be 15 inches um, perfect we are waiving that requirement I vote that was Nap I, uh, James Jennison and I, Jeff Bran. Bran I. Candace Kranz. Kranz I. Uh, Buddy Hackett. Hackett I. Uh, waiver is approved. <clears throat> Jamie, don't Next we have. Oh, I'm sorry, Ron. I, I'm going from memory. I apologize. It's not that good. Ron, I'm gonna, Ron I'm Allard. Hi. <laughs> I got a mess going here. Let me just get my other paper out. Uh, now we'll move on to uh, 4773. Um, this one is 36 inches of coverage. I I make a motion to approve a waiver of 477 parents three minimum available coverage for the applicant parent can ensure as LLC. As not granting the waiver. <clears throat> Don't get muted, Jeff, I think. As not granting the waiver would pose an unnecessary hardship to the applicant, granting the waiver would not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulations. Second. Motion by Jeff Brand, seconded by Andy Knapp. Uh, Buddy Hackett. Actually, can I just get clarification on that? They accept or decline? Uh, uh, granting the waiver to allow them to not put 36 inches of fill over a pipe, um, which is required by regulations. We're going to okay. waive that requirement. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Hackett, I. Uh, Ron Allard. Allard, I. Andy Knapp. I. Jeff Brand. Brand, I. James Jennison, I. Candace Kranz. Kranz, I. Uh, waiver is granted. Now we're moving on to 412 outdoor lighting. Uh, we do have lighting requirements, but due to the nature of the campground, they're asking for a waiver from um, the lighting <clears throat> in, in this part. Um, any questions, comments, or a motion is in order? I will make a motion to waive Article 4.12 outdoor lighting for Barrington Shores LLC application as <clears throat> not granting a waiver would pose unnecessary hardship to the applicant and granting the waiver would not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulations. Second. Motion by Jeff Brand, seconded by Andy Knapp, James Jennison, I, Candace Kranz. Kranz, I. Ron Allard. Allard, I. Andy Knapp. I. Jeff Brand. Brand, I. Buddy Hackett. Hackett, I. Uh, waiver 412 is granted. Um, and we will, I believe, we'll postpone uh, 47210 until we ha uh, get confirmation from Dubois and Kings on the test pit results and their recommendations. So <laughs> that, that means that, that we'll have two items left. One is on that waiver and then also uh, approval of the application. So when would the applicant uh, feel that they're going to have that information and when would like they like to continue? What date would they like to continue this to? Uh, we, we will have revised information to Dubois and King by next week. Uh, and I would think that Dubois and King would be able to respond in a week after that. That puts us um do you think you could make it for the, the meeting on the 20th or do you want to um go out to may 4th i think i'd like to meet on the 20th yep seems reasonable I and mean, getting to the end here um all right uh, so a motion to continue to april 20th i make a motion to continue the uh Application for Barrington Shores LLC to April 20th, 2021. Second. Uh, motion by Jeff Brand, seconded by Ron Allard. Buddy Hackett. 
Hackett Eye. Candace Kranz. Kranz Eye. Ron Allard. Allard Eye. Andy Knapp. Knapp Eye. Jeff Brand. Brand Eye. James Jennison Eye. Uh, motion granted. Uh, we'll see you on the 20th. All right. Thank, Thank you. you members Thank of the you board. so much. Have a great night. You as well. Thank you. Next up, we have Ron Hurlbert, request by applicant site review and to add storage building 5,000 square feet. Welcome, um, Mr. Coronati, correct? That's correct. Mr. Roy Hurlbert, the owner. Are you with us as well? Welcome, Roy. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Whenever you're ready. All right. Uh, Joe Coronati, Jones and Beach Engineers, uh, representing Roy Hurlbert, Roy Hurlbert, the owner. Um, we were here March 2nd. Um, at that time, the, the planning board provided us um, a lot of good comments on the site plans. Um, we resubmitted plans to address planning board comments on um, March 11th. And then after that, we then received uh, comments from Du Bois and King. And we responded to those comments uh, March 27th, I think, or um, 29th, maybe. Um, and so if it's um, appropriate, I could. Um, share my screen and go over those comments with the board. That'd be great. Thank you. All right. So the um, I'll go over the planning board comments first. Um, the at the meeting, there was a uh, quite a bit of discussion about the um, about the existing trees. And hopefully you can all see my screen. I can't see. Uh... All right. Um, you should be looking at the existing additions plan. Um, or actually the demolition plan. Uh, we added all the existing trees that we located near the um, proposed building. So those are now on. Um, the existing and demolition plans. Um, you can see them here, all the existing trees. On the demolition plan, we outline which ones we'll be removing uh, for the construction. It's about, um, my little cursor keeps popping up, it's about uh, 12 trees. Um, and then we have a landscape plan that we added uh, proposed trees, which was a request the board had um, and I'll switch to that. Um, so the landscape plan is sheet L2, and we added a row of trees along the back of the building um, to buffer the building from the um, from the neighbors. Really, only have one one abutter um, on this side. It's a residential house. Um, so we added a, a row of trees here. There are no windows on the uh, back of the building. So it's a, it's basically a, the low wall um, since the gable end will face Tolan Road. Um, and um, so we have added those trees. We've also added, I'm gonna switch back to the site plan. Um, we've clarified the travel routes on the property. What we're looking at is a two way travel for the for the front of the property. This is where the paved driveway leads you to the front door. That'll be two way travel. And then we have a, a gravel existing gravel drive that's around the building. This will be used mainly for employees and uh, deliveries and any larger vehicles that come in. They have the ability to to loop around. Uh, we've made that a one way. And we've added a do not enter sign um, right at the entrance of that gravel road. So people, when they come in, will know that uh, they're to go, you know, basically on the pavement and to the front door. 
Um, we've also added a, a fire lane, no parking sign um, located here so that nobody parks between these two buildings um, and you know leaves the vehicle unattended since that's the fire lane. Um, we have added the dumpster area. We're proposing the dumpster here. Um, it's it's hidden from uh, from view from both uh, Route 125 by the building and from Tolan Road. You'd have a hard time seeing it. You'd have to look down this corridor and uh, get a glimpse of it. But it's a uh, it's a good area for the owner. It provides good access to the um, to the staff that are working in the back side of the building. And uh, and it's easy to pick up from a trash truck. Uh, can hit it back up and then leave uh, without having to really turn around, which is nice. Um, not always the case on commercial developments. Um, we've also added notes um, over on the side on the site plan that talk about the hours of operation. Um, we added the uh, snow storage. Um, you know, to be sh snow storage, we've shown on the plan uh, snow to be stored in these areas and if uh, need be to be trucked off site. Um, we've added notes about the storage material and the maximum height that the fire chief uh, requested that we do not uh, store stuff uh, above 12 feet high in the warehouse. Um, we've added a vicinity map to the cover sheet. Um, that the board requested. We also added the lights to the architectural plans. Um, so you can see that we're adding uh, three lights across the, the front of the warehouse. This is the side that's facing um, sort of the back of the existing building. And we have three lights and we have the cone of illumination shown from those lights. Um, coming down um, and that was I believe the items that the board had requested um, and I don't know if you want me to go point by point through the um, oops, the um, Du Bois and King comments or I could just summarize those if you'd like uh, if you could run through them that'd be great touch on each one um, yep I can do that thank you um, the uh, we were we were we supplied a letter to the um, to the um, to Du Bois and King in the town um, stated March 25th. Um, a lot of these are, are technical in nature. Um, first one talks about the infiltration drip edge, which is what we're proposing for stormwater. We have um, since we're early only adding a um, a building here, no actual parking. Um, we only really have the the building to deal with for stormwater runoff. Uh, so we're proposing to do that with stone drip edges, deep stone drip edges on either on either side of the building where the water will run off the roof and basically be infiltrated into the ground via uh, just a stone drip edge, which is a, a simple, easy way to handle um, roof runoff. And um, so the First comment refers to adding a 25 foot vegetated turf buffer between the drives and parking. Um, and that's not possible here. We don't have, you know, we don't really have driveways and parking in 25 feet of buffer areas. We have the, the building and then we have a gravel uh, drive in front of it and we have basically just um, uh, woods behind it. Uh, so we're disagreeing with them on that one, uh, saying that a 25 foot vegetated filter strip is not necessary here um, as we're not accepting stormwater from parking areas or driveways. It's only roof water, which is allowed without a vegetated filter strip. Can, can you remind us of, you've got the drive, that gravel drive going down between the, the back of the building and the uh, down towards Tolan Road. What, how does that slope and where does water on that driveway go? Uh, the driveway is it's fairly flat. The whole site's fairly flat, but the um, these are the contours. These are one foot contours. And from this gravel drive, water heads towards 
uh, Tolan Road, and then it either departs off the road and comes down into this uh, existing lawn area. And part of the pavement goes off this way into an existing lawn area that's actually part of the state's right of way. Um, and so it it kind of leaves the site in two different locations. Uh, it either goes, I guess that's north, northwest or uh, southwest. Okay, thank you. And um, then the, oops, wrong letter. Um, the second one is the recommend uh, recommendation to add uh, temporary erosion control measures for excavations for the relocation of the underground storage tank and the underground electric line. We did add the silt fence to the plans uh, for those areas, even though they're it's a very temporary disturbance. Basically, they'll dig a trench, put the conduits in and backfill the trench all in the same day. Um, but we did add the silt fence uh, regardless. Um, the third one uh, refers to the stone drip edge. Um, and we have provided the detail uh, that meets the stormwater manual for the state. And we've added uh, two observation wells on the ends of the of the drip edge so that uh, those would be um, something that could be monitored in the future um, as to what the infiltration, how the infiltration rate is going. Um, we have a very we have a fairly sandy site and we don't expect any issues with infiltration. Um, the fourth item uh, is that the applicant added detail for erosion control matting, um, which is basically uh, slope protection. Um, and we have changed the, we actually modified the, um, uh, we did add the detail. We've also modified the, um, the slopes to be three to one instead of two to one. So they could be more of a mowed lawn and maintained uh, easier and have much less erosion potential. Um, the fifth item is a uh, drainage analysis question, and it gets into um, um, the sizing of the drip edge, which is something that we do in a program called HydroCAD, where we size our stormwater uh, treatment systems and our ponds and how that uh, and that analyzes how the uh, stormwater from the different storms uh, will react with our with our uh, drainage system. So in that analysis, um, we have uh, widened the uh, stone drip edge to account for the larger storms that the stormwater manual requires, um, and to accept any water from the um, from the gravel area. Um, the sixth item is um uh let me see this one was a um oh i see the um since the roof is slightly the roof has an overhang over the building um apparently we did not account for the roof overhang in the impervious calculation for the uh, proposed building so we added that it's it's only a one foot overhang but we added that to the analysis to add that uh, approximately uh, 50 square feet into the analysis. Um, that was done. The seventh item is another drainage analysis question. Um, and we revised the HydroCAD model to um, to match the horizontal area of the of the drip edges. The eighth one is also drainage analysis related. Um, and it talks about backfill um and the backfill is we're using basically the the other than the stone any other backfill will be the existing native material so whatever they okay. dig up yeah if i could ask you a question about that because it gets a little confusing i also looked at the detail that's in the drawing you're talking about backfill being similar to native soils just and you're up against the foundation so i'm not sure even looking at the print, it doesn't get a little confusing. What you're going to do, you're going to have a four foot wide area, the length of the building um, on the north and south sides. You extended that out from what you had previously. I think you addressed it somewhere else to account for the fact the overhangs 
come out afoot. So therefore, I think somewhere else, uh, Dubois and King made a comment about, well, you could overshoot your this uh, edge drip edge drainage area, and so therefore you extended it out to four feet. But going back, so but the trench itself is going to be what three feet deep, and it's going to be three quarter inch stone. It's not, you're not backfilling up against the foundation with native soils in that area four feet wide. It'll be three quarter inch stone, correct? That's correct. On the two sides that have the roof that direct water to it, and then the other, the gable end side would be the native material. And I think that's why it's a little confusing. We do have both types of uh, backfill. So yes, it'll be stone right up against the foundation. Yeah, it, it, in particular, it, it just seemed a little confusing on the uh, on the detail because it, it makes a note about backfill with native materials. And in reality, the trench itself is, is all three quarter inch stone. It, it does say that it's hard to see because it's inside of the trench itself, but it's uh, it is three quarter inch stone. OK, thank you. Yes, no problem. Um, The um, eighth item, um, oh no, the ninth item is uh, relates to test pits. It says no test pits were performed within the footprint of the proposed infiltration drip edges. Um, and what we did is we looked at the the septic design that was done for the property. Um, and during the when they did the septic design, they had an 18 inch water table. So instead of digging new test pits, we're just utilizing the um, which the septic is right next to this building. Um, we're we're accounting for the uh, water table to have that same 18 inch depth. So that's how we determined the uh, uh, the seasonal high. And the the building is raised above the existing grade a little bit and the back of the building uh, is entirely in fill. Um, if you look at the uh, the back of the building, in this side we have uh, we have about three and a half feet of fill that we have to bring in, and in the front we're about um, we're about uh, I'd say almost a foot above existing grade, and then we have the 18 inch water table as well. So we have. <clears throat> We have separation to uh, at least we have two and a half feet of storage above the seasonal high water table. And that's obviously a uh, seasonal high, not a year long uh, situation. So we'll and we've accounted for that in the hydrocat analysis. Um, with that, that all time. that that all sounds reasonable. But if you go back and pull up that, yeah, that print. The leach field, I don't know where the test pits were done for the leach field. I assume in the area where the leach field is located. Um, yes. So that, that seems to be some distance from where you're proposing uh, the building. So can you explain whether there's anything, uh, you know, in it, any obstructions in the soil, any differences there? that would uh, that would preclude the test bits done for the leach field uh, being representative of the area of the proposed build the uh, well I'm trying to think how do I would answer that the um, no I would not see anything different in the soils between the two they're they're only about maybe 60 feet away from each other uh, maybe 80 feet um, from the leach field to the building. Um, we do have through this one spot, through the building itself, there's a contour elevation of 197 and then it goes up to 200. So there's about three feet of grade change uh, within about half the building. Uh, and our building is above the high contour. So we're basically working in a fill condition. And so we'll be um, I would suspect we'd have better water tables the higher we move up. Um, and that's the reason the uh, the leach field is a raised mound, but the leach field was also placed uh, somewhat close to this existing wetland. 
Um, so I think as we move away from that wetland and move upgrade, up gradient, we'll actually have better separation to water table. And um, I don't think, uh, I think, you know, for the most part with the consideration that there's minimal drainage on the site, you know, uh, drainage system on the site, I don't think there's been a, um, a flooding concern or a, a um, water standing concern that you would see if the soils were worse. If we had poor soils, um, I think you'd see puddles, you know, around the site area. Uh, but based on my observations of going out there and been by going by the site for a number of years, I've never seen anything like that uh, in this area. Um, and the the wetland is approximately four feet. I think it's I'm zoom in so I can see my contours a little better. Yeah, so the wetlands right around elevation 196. And so our building is uh, is four and a half feet. We're at 200.7 uh, for the warehouse. So we're four and a half feet above that wetland for grade. So I think we have adequate separation given those factors uh, with the building at that elevation and this type of uh, treatment infiltration or stormwater infiltration method. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, the tenth item is another drainage analysis. This talks about the saturated hydraulic conductivity, which is basically a uh, fancy term for how fast the water infiltrates into the ground. Um, and the um, type of soil we have out here is uh, what's known as a Deerfield loamy sand. Um, so it's a sandy material with some with some fines in it that. Um, that give it a, a pretty fast infiltration rate. So the um, the NRCS guidelines provide us with an infiltration rate of 14.17 inches per hour. Um, and based on how the AOT manual works and the stormwater manual, we're allowed to use a half of that for our infiltration. That's a safety factor of two to one. So we use the infiltration rate of 7.08 inches per hour. Um, and that's how we determined um, the infiltration rate used for this drip edges. Um, the 11th item is also drainage analysis, which was um, um, revising um, the USGS map. That's part of the narrative of the drainage report, which we did. Um, the twelfth item um, is a discussion about the. Um, let me see the. Um, oh, at the time we were on the original design that Du Bois and King reviewed, we had narrower drip edges, only two foot wide. Uh, <coughs> then we had uh, from that area, from the drip edge to the existing gravel, we were adding more gravel to fill in that area. We've modified that so that the area that we're proposing would all be stoned and would all be drip edge instead of having any impervious gravel area being added. Um, and the final item is in reference to an inspection and maintenance manual, which is a standard of the AOT. Um, and so we've also added that in the hydrocat analysis in the drainage report. Uh, and that's all of them. They were the those 13 items. I don't know if they've had a chance to review those and provide a letter back to the town for this meeting. I did not see one, um, but it may have come in last minute. It did. <clears throat> Marsha, did you ever get a response from um, Du Bois and King? No, on their not yet. This was this was not that long ago, correct? That they this is a rather I don't think stance. Our letter is dated the 25th. Yeah, that would have that would have been. I anticipate Week. it will come in shortly, and then um, you you folks can work through with B and K any other final issues. Does the board have any questions on anything we've discussed? Oh uh, yeah. I <coughs> Yeah, I have a couple. Uh, 
the uh, uh, and they have to do with the, the the buffers, the visual buffers. So if I go to uh, L two, the landscape plan. I'm going to bring that back up. If you if you can. Yep. All right, so if I, in looking at the proposed building and you have to the south of the building, you have the proposed planning, uh, plantings uh, of uh, it's uh, blue spruce and, and uh, balsam fir. So when I look at the, your proposed planning and then I look back at the demolition plan and you were taking out a majority of the trees between the proposed building and the property line. I, I, I question, um, I guess my question is, it, it seems like those are sparse plantings. Uh, what's the distance between those, those trees? We have them uh, uh, 15 feet on center. Okay. I I question whether if you were to have a second row of plantings that were in the spaces between yeah right right about where you're going if you had a second row right there that filled that in whether that wouldn't be a better visual buffer so that's number one number two if you go up to the right <clears throat> to where your dumpster location is. Um, I have a little bit of concern that there's no buffering between that and the property lines where the residence is on the south side. So whether there should be, could be uh, trees that would form some kind of visual buffer for the uh, for the dumpster and or maybe a, a typical, it's not unusual for those to be fenced in a, a kind of on the uh, similar to where you have the silt fencing while you're doing the work that you have it around that pad wherever the uh, the dumpster is going to be so uh, can, can you address each of those issues yes um, well i guess i'll address the dumpster first since i have that page up um, the dumpster is pretty far from the property line you know the building here is 50 feet wide um, so you can see that we have about, I'd say about 70, maybe 75 feet to the property line. And half of that is currently wooded. And this is a, a very thick woods through here. Um, and so I think that, I don't think the neighbor is gonna see the back of the dumpster uh, through the woods. Um, and given its distance to the, um, to it, um, I think it's gonna blend in with the building you're not really going to see um, the actual dumpster itself. The um, we could look at the aerial if you wanted to see that. Um, I have to get that. Uh, I I I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And I think the I believe the house is actually, you know, more. Uh, once again, I have to see the aerial, but I think the house obviously is off that property line, and there's still a pretty good row of trees. They cleared many of the trees on their lot, but some of these trees are on their property. Um, and then the landscaping, one of the things that we did show the trees, maybe we maybe they're shown a little small, but the um, the trees will fill in. Um, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Um, because 15 feet on center, if you're familiar with the a balsam fir uh, or a Fraser fir, um, you know, they're basically um, uh, Christmas trees. And we're proposing that they're six to eight feet tall. So they're going to be, um, they're obviously going to get bigger, um, but they're also going to fill in, um, you know, at six to eight foot tall, you know, we'll probably have a, um, at least a um, um, branches starting out, you know, four feet from the center of the tree. And then um, 
And so we're trying to give them a little bit of room to grow. I would be concerned if we added in another row that we might stifle some of the growth um, because we don't want to obviously cut more trees to plant them. Um, and so one thing we could do is we could potentially um, shrink this to 10 feet on center and stick with the one row of trees um, as and I think I, that'll fill in. Yeah, I will say, Jeff, driving by those, the, the existing trees are uh, poorly maintained and the, the branches are fairly high up. It's uh, not much of a visual buffer currently. So I think that the the fir trees will certainly make a much uh, better buffer than what's there now. Um, it's just my opinion. Um, I, I, I understand that, but it, it just so happens that at the home I grew up in, we, we planted balsam firs and spruces to use as a border on our property. And it based on how long it took them to grow, their sizes, so on and so forth. Uh, I, I think they're great trees to use. It, it's just a matter of uh, if you drop the spacing to 10 feet, I'd feel more comfortable with this. I, I, I think it is going to take some period of time. They don't grow overly fast, but uh, that would probably provide a better cover. Okay. All right. Um, Ron, I think you had your hand up next. Yeah, I got a couple of things. One's relatively minor. On A1, the plan view, uh, the, the man door is on the right. Correct. Yes. On the A2, it's on the it's on the left. Oh yes. <laughs> Could be one or the other, I think. Right. Yeah, we can make that change. Good catch, Ron. Uh, other thing is probably more important is uh, was there a, a 9.6 wetland buffer waiver request with this application? Uh, Ron, this, no. this, this, uh, I know they showed the buffer, but there, this is a predates the buffer, so it really, it, it doesn't fall within the regulation. Actually, I think it does, Marsha. If you look at C4, the uh, new pole and the underground conduit is in the wetlands buffer, I believe. There, there is no buffer, is the, uh, what I was trying to say. This, this lot was created. Uh, prior to the buffer ordinance. But the new, this is new, new proposal. It doesn't right? matter. It doesn't matter in Barrington. The, right. It's, yeah. the, it's when the lot's established. If they tried yeah. to subdivide, if they tried to subdivide the lot, then they'd be restricted yeah. to the new requirements. Well, okay. Then yeah. Each, each town is a little bit different, you know, each city on how they handle that. But where construction's going on in the wetlands buffer? No, this does not require a waiver. There's no buffer there. There's no buffer, yeah. The the it's, buffer doesn't automatically exist when the when the regulations changed is the new it's when the the lot was created. So if there was if if when the lot was created there was no wetland buffer, there's none there now, even though new zoning would recognize such an impact. Um, you know, it's the same thing with the house lot that's created pre zoning. Um, you could build a house there and not be impeded by the new buffer restrictions um, until you go to subdivide it, and then you're, and then then you're you're, you're required to meet those expectations. All right. It is Thank good you. information though to be on there. It's just that it's it's not applicable from a regulatory standpoint. But a a good catch, Ron, mm -hmm. on your part. Um, did you have anything else, Ron? Nope, that's it. Uh, buddy, you had your hand up. <clears throat> Uh, yes, this is a very, very minor thing, but I, I don't know if it's something to be helpful uh, for uh, for Joe. If uh, we look back at the, uh, the the plan that showed the traffic around the building. Yes. And I, I'm not sure if if I if I heard this correctly, but if you look at as we're looking at the building, the the second building that the, the proposed to to build, there was something about a um, fire lane, no parking sign that was to the right of that. Yes. It does. Does it seem like that that 
sign would be better served if it was somewhere to the left where uh heading towards the you know where it's the, the one way in before the building because if you if you're driving in there and you get all the way through that building and see no parking then you know it, it just seems to be it'd be better or maybe a second sign where you see that that greenery looks like some sort of shrubs or something they're going to be put in there yeah somewhere the, the other direction to the left yeah over, right over somewhere in this area here it's a it's a minute detail, but it just seems like it might be better served to have the sign there than further in. I guess the <clears throat> on this side we have the uh, we have a do not enter sign to inform people that you know not to come in this direction. That and yeah, so that's a one way that's a one way gravel oh, right. drive. Okay, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. So maybe okay. move it the other way though. That's a good comment. Maybe move it a little further to the other way. We could move it a little further this way. The only thing is we'd have to move it, you know, out of the way of the dumpster. Um, and then it, I guess the reason we picked this location is because it was past these parking spaces right. that are staff parking. So I don't want, I didn't want to, yeah, we didn't want to confuse good. people and put oh, no gotcha. parking up yeah, here. That's good. that's good actually. Okay. And then have parking, but the, these were really will be staff parking, not customer parking um, in the back, so. All right, buddy, do you have anything else? No, I, that's it's. I was missing the uh, employee parking and different things over there, and I'm I'm good. That's that's fine. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Marsha. You, you still had your hand up. Did you have something else to add? No, no, I'm all set. All right, Andy, you had your hand up. Yep. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to lower my hand here. Um, what? So one of the things that I was looking at with this, with the the new structure going up. Um, looking at the overhead door and the spacing between the two buildings is a person who kind of deals with large equipment and the idea of taking a crate and having to have a fork truck move a crate into there 20 and also unload um a most likely a tractor trailer 20 feet is not a lot of room to move anything around to get in that into that building there it's you're going to have a, a tight movement and on a gravel drive with a powered industrial truck. All, all of that's going to create a lot of challenge for you. Right. The, um, I'm certainly not a expert in driving forklifts. Um, I don't know if uh, Roy, I know Roy Herbert is on the call. Um, he knows the size of these crates better than I do. I know they're not very deep. They're Roy, approximately what size are the the crates that the machinery comes in? They're about four, four and a half feet wide. Um, and I've purchased a fork truck with uh, I, I don't know the, the the name of the tire, but it's not a like a, a cement floor type tire. It's a it's a air almost snow tread type tire fork truck. Yep. Yep, they're common pneumatic tires, and then I'm assuming you probably have fork extenders um, yeah. to be able to pick. Uh, it's just looking at the length, the average length of a fork truck with forks, you're probably roughly around 10 feet, and then whatever your length of your crate is, you got four foot wide plus whatever your width is. You're, you're just going to be really tight trying to offload and then move that into that space, just so you're aware of that. Yes, sir. Um, I just don't want to see a tractor trailer truck parked on Toll End Road, especially right there at the corner. No, that will not happen. I mean, I think they, you would think they got enough room to pull past that door so the back door is even with that door, wouldn't you, Andy? Um, well, what I'm looking at is when you get past it, if you've got to come in with a fork truck from the side to pick off of it, you may actually have to put the fork truck on the existing paved space and unload over there. I just, I, 20 feet is not enough room to, to offload from the side of a tractor trailer or even the back of a tractor trailer. You, you just don't have any room to unload. So, yeah, keep that in mind, Mr. Herbert. We can't have you on the, on the main road. <laughs> I don't think you can push no. the building back any further. Can you really? Not really. Well, 
Correct. If we uh, we have probably another um, three or four feet, but we keep pushing, that will push the grading and potentially the clearing um, of the trees with the neighbor. So we'd, uh, I guess, like not to push it back. And I yeah. think that the tractor trailer loads from what I was talking with Roy about, you know, they're not um, highly frequent. You know, he'll get his uh, inventory in that way. He probably wishes he could get more inventory in right now. Um, but the, you can, you know, the, um, I think he said he's got 25 sea dews coming in. Uh, and those will probably all fit on one tractor trailer. And then um, that'll be his inventory, you know, for that, that type of uh, machinery. So it, I think a lot of this will be early when he's setting up and getting them in there. Uh, before he opens, and then uh, then it will be a big lull and tractor Seasonal. trailers coming to the yeah. site. Seasonal deliveries, right? Um, yeah, but I think Andy's point is a good one. You know, a trailer is eight foot wide. The fork truck is ten foot long. The load is probably uh, with the forks is probably another four feet. You know, you, 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 I agree with Andy. You're gonna have a tough time getting. Them. Yeah, and I mean logistical. Yeah, and I agree. Logistical nightmares aside, I mean they just. The, knowing they can't unload them in the street and you're, if they have to do it in the front parking lot right you're uh, you're 73 feet with a trailer and a tractor so you're going to be you're going to be almost the entire length of that building to get in there and and then to unload it it's just going to you're going to have challenges and i i think you have to be mindful of that and uh, with 12 width I, I would. I understand the concern here, but I, I'm I'm looking at this building's 100 feet long. The the door is roughly centered, so you've got 50 feet down that driveway from the doorway, and then looking at it, you've got at least another 50 feet before you intersect with the end of the gravel meets the uh, existing paved two-way driveway. So, I mean that that's more than enough to pull the tractor forward uh to where roughly that do not enter sign is and then to you know offload with that beyond the door and then you've got 20 feet plus four plus feet 24 feet to turn to get into the door i i, I agree you got to be careful uh but i i'm not overly concerned about this i think it's it's, it's important to point out that you know, and I'm, I'm, they probably know better than us the challenges. And I mean, I've been in situations where the driver will inch the truck forward and you sit in the garage door bay and you pick one off, back up, he pulls forward, you pick one up, back, you know, it, it's, again, it could be logistically un, unenjoyable, but it's a two se couple seasonal deliveries and um, will be their problem to solve, I think. Um, yep. But I just yep. want to make sure it's, it's pointed out and looking at the way, um, Recreation equipment is selling lately. I, I think it'll be more than a couple seasonal deliveries. <laughs> yeah, and we, and we hope for the best. We hope that's the case for you. But, um, yep. The only other qu the question I had, and it's not in our purview, but I think it might come up later, is the second means of egress from that building. I only see one door. Um, I'm sure that's something John Huckins and, and Fire will address if it's a concern in commercial buildings. Um, that I, I would assume it is, but with just one man door, I would assume there has to be a second means of egress to consider. Um, so I'll just put that out there. Um, any other questions from board members? Uh, yeah, I got, I got one more. We did ask, and I, um, I, I maybe just missed it. I'll just ask the question. So we said that you are going to be restricted because this isn't going to be a sprinkled it's going to be an unheated, unsprinklered building that there be a restriction. You can't stack anything in the building over 12 feet high. Is, is that on the plan somewhere or how is that going to be addressed? Yes, I believe we. Um, note 13 on uh, the site plan uh, talks about uh, business and storage. Business and storage building to have fire alarms, stored items, and warehouse not to exceed 12 feet in height. Okay, thanks. That's on C2, Jeff. Yeah, I got it. Okay. All right. Um, uh, let's and um, oh, one last. Uh, 
So the, the town planner uh, noted that there is a required note in our regulations about required erosion control measures should be installed prior to disturbance of uh, the site surface area, dot, dot, dot. Uh, it, did you, have you added that to the plan? I, I looked at erosion control measures and didn't see it there. Uh, I don't know. We did not add that yet. We had a, we just received that, and we can certainly add that note without a problem in there. Uh, there may actually be a note similar to that, but maybe not word for word. Yeah, I, there is a similar note, and then it refers back to E1. Uh, somewhere in, uh, I did find a note that had a, kind of addressed the issue. Uh, yeah, so note Note three on sheet C3. Right. Uh, site grade, site right. grade shall not proceed until the erosion control measures have been installed. Right. right. And it says C construction sequence on sheet E1. I went and looked at that. And I also looked at the, the erosion control measures. It's just we have a specific note that is required in the regulations. And, and so that needs to be added to meet the regulations. Not a problem. We can add that to the site plan as well. Um, all right. Um, if there's no further questions, I'll take the opportunity to open up public comment. If there's anyone um, with us tonight that would like to ask a question or have a comment to make. Now, uh, you can star six if you're on a phone and you're calling in. All right, seeing no hands or hearing no comments, I'll close uh, public comment. Uh, does the board have any more questions? So I believe we're just waiting on a response from Du Bois and King. Is that where we stand? Correct. I have a kind of a short little total that we have that um, for, you know, keep track for the final notice of decision. But um, I think once we get the comments, and usually when they get whittled down by DNK, they can work with the applicant to get those final ones um, taken care of. Um, so I suggest, suggest obviously we continue, but coming up with what we think the day will, you know, we, when we can get back from Du Bois and King and what a reasonable time frame would be. Yeah. And do you have a feeling on that, Marsha? What's reasonable? Um, is the 20th too soon? Um, the 4th? Knowing I'm sure they're. I don't know if we're going to. Um, what day did you know? What day did they submit? I mean, it's not too much of a gap between one and the other here. Um, well, does the applicant have any feelings about this? Yeah. Um, well, it's. It's a little challenging to know. We don't know when the, um, you know, we don't know exactly when we'll get the comments, and then, um, and then how much time you'll want the plans ahead of the meeting. Um, you know, with the meeting two weeks away, um, we could receive the comments, you know, a week from now, and then we wouldn't have the plans to you till possibly the night of the meeting, which may not be. Well, yeah. the requirement is that you submit any. Subsequent submittals after the application, the information has to be in seven days ahead of the meeting. So if we put you for the 4th of May, would that be acceptable? I, I think so. I don't, yeah, because I don't, with having to be seven days in advance and the meeting only being two weeks away, we'd have to have revisions to you in a week, and we don't know when we'll get I, I mean, I know. The fourth is reasonable, don't you, Jamie? Maybe I think it's more? reasonable. I mean, I, I never have a problem with, you know, asking to continue if they're not ready. You know, I know some sometimes that's a, that causes issues, but, you know, putting them earlier than continuing um, in, in an effort to uh, move the process along. But um, the fourth, as long as the applicants, ex you know, OK with the fourth, um, I think it's. The 20th doesn't really sound like it'd be realistic under the circumstances. The fourth no. seems like a better target. Okay. 
right? Let's, uh, um, if there's no other questions or comments from the board, um, a motion to uh, continue to May 4th. I make a motion to uh, continue this application to May 4th, 2021. Second. Motion by Jeff Brand, seconded by Ron Allard, uh, James Jennison, I, Jeff Brand. Brand, I. Andy Knapp. I. Ron Allard. Allard, I. Candace Kranz. Kranz, I. Lee Hackett. Hackett, I. Uh, all in favor, motion carries, continued to May, uh, uh, May 4th. Uh, and, and I'll just, I think the only thing that was mentioned that to, to address was the trees planting, really, from, from the perspective, if that's... The 10 feet on center. Yeah, shrinking them the up note. or shrinking them up or adding a couple, I think was the only major thing uh, that I, you know, that I heard, so. Yeah, and um, we also need to fix the notes to address the, what's required. Sure. And please move yep. the door for me. <laughs> <laughs> and move that the was door. the second meeting. He's pointed that out. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. And we'll yes, see you, thank you. See you shortly. Thank you. Have a good night. You All too. Right. Thank you. Uh, moving on to number four, a request by applicant uh, Glenda and David Henderson, uh, 23911-TC-21. Applicant for two lot subdivision. Lot 1.1 would be 11.81, and lot 1.2 would be 17.19. Um, I believe we have Mr. Garvey here for that. Good evening, folks. How are you? Doing great yourself. Good. Whenever you're ready. Okay. I won't reiterate what you've already been through, but um, two lot subdivision, uh, fairly simple. Um, 28.99 uh, acres, subdivided into two lots. Um, we uh, went and got a variance through the ZBA uh, for the uh, single family use in the town center district uh, back in February that was approved. Uh, had a CONCOM uh, visit on Saturday morning last. Um, you should have a letter from them. I have not seen one yet. We do have one. You do have one, okay. Yeah. Um, if you would be so kind at some point to um, read that out for me. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but it, it, it had no objections to, uh, after okay. the site walk, they had no objections to um, any proposed. It was actually an email, wasn't it? Yes, correct. That's why I don't have it in front of me. Actually, I, I, uh, I, I think I think I can call it up. Well, he's uh, doing that. Well, he, well you're doing that. Uh, we've got about 1,380 feet uh, from the road up to the large open uh, square uh, that's out back uh, where you hit the stone wall. Um, the fire chief had discussions with him as to the driveway. The driveway will be designed um, to have a 20 foot uh, wide driving uh, lane. Um, there will likely be up close to the 1300 foot mark a um, uh, turnout, small turnout uh, that would allow for somebody to uh, pass by with no problem. Um, there are two wetlands crossings, uh, both very minor. Uh, those are currently in design, should be done shortly with uh, Mark Jacobs and the engineer. Um, and the driveway uh, permit was granted along quite a while ago in the previous subdivision. Um, I have not checked to see if that's still valid, but it should be. I will follow up on that uh, the, uh, probably in the next day or so. Um, the driveway uh, is actually at a location where there's an existing curb cut anyway. Uh, uh, Jeff, you get you get a question. Um, yeah, I uh, okay. So I have uh, <laughs> what the conservation commission said uh, prior to our site visit on April three. The commission was concerned about the potential stormwater runoff from a shared driveway into the wetlands below. Following our site review, the objections to the subdivision are substantially removed. 
While development across a wetland is hardly ever a net gain for the environment, this project does not appear to create any special concerns. If there are any further questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just, oh, are you trying, to, I'm confused, are you trying to subdivide the pork chop subdivision into two lots? Is that my understanding? That's correct. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask about that too, because I, so back in 2006, I think it was, two, yes, 2006, there was put in an applicant that said that uh, you want, we're asking to locate a driveway 40 foot easement, and I'll come back to that. This driveway will serve as lot one dash one, one house only. And so that's what the zoning, uh, the ZBA approved for you to put a house in that zone, one lot only, uh, back in 2006. So uh, one thing is, you know, on the plans that I got, there didn't appear to be any existing conditions plan. It simply shows this back lot, uh, front lot, and then it shows a back lot divided as you're proposing. So, so did you... Uh, so y y was there a house put out there? Was there anything done? Did you act on the 2006 um, ZBA decision? Uh, it's not us. Uh, the owners, David and Glenda Henderson, did not do anything other than um, leave the lot set. So the special exception that was granted, um, basically, I don't believe that there is a time frame associated with the special exception. I'm not, uh, I thought there was, but uh, so this is all one property still or? Correct. So the front lot isn't, hasn't been separated. So the, I don't. So the, the front lot with the structures was separated off. The lot that exists is the frontage to the left of the structures and the neck that goes up to the area where it widens out. So you're trying to subdivide the existing house from the back lot? No, that's already been completed. You're trying to subdivide the back lot again? That's correct. That's not permitted, is it? Yes, it is. Well, <laughs> Okay. Why would you say it's permitted? I mean, it's a it's a back lot subdivision. It. I think the oh, wait, wait, wait. Hey, back you're not, lot. Yeah, um, the back, back lot was already created in 2006, correct? Uh, the previous subdivision created the lot, the 30 acre lot. Yes. All right. So that was created. It got approval in 2006, but it said you can only put one house back there. Correct. Uh, on that plan, it did, yes. All right. And doesn't the back lot, our back lot subdivision regulation say you can only have one house on a back lot subdivision? How does that? No, that's no actually, I think that says two. Two. That's not a back lot subdivision on the first time around. The first time around on 2006, that was just a, in, a straight subdivision. And the subdivision created the lot out front and the lot out back with the attic, with the frontage, et cetera. The only thing that was done was the, because of the amount of wetlands that are on the frontage, the 40 foot access easement was created over the front lot to get to the back lot. Yeah, well, you just used the term back lot. You, they did create, it's, you said it's, it's I say, I say back lot because it's a lot that's out back. It's <laughs> right. Totally, it's still a valid lot with frontage. It's not a back lot subdivision. Well, okay. you keep bringing up the frontage, by the way. So there's a 40 foot easement, correct? There's a 40 foot easement and 100 and some odd feet over on the frontage on the left hand so side. You, so you get where it notes L13, L14, L15, that's calculated in the frontage, correct? Uh, that I can't say. So, 
so can you tell us on the plans where we get you've got 40 feet of easement but you're saying you have frontage somewhere else other than the easement i have frontage, i have frontage on the left hand side where you see l15 l14 and l13 that is the frontage for the lot that has the neck that goes out to the larger lot. You're just taking access from a 40 foot easement because it's That's wet. That's correct. The access okay. is there specifically not to go anywhere near the wetlands that are on the other side. Gotcha. So the only, and Mr. Garvey is correct in what he's explaining to you, the only, what happened with the ZBA is they allowed, um, they allowed to create, right, they allowed to, because it's in town center, okay, which normally doesn't allow for single family homes unless they're part of a PUD. It allowed for that single family use. So, um, and they actually turned down them. They had originally asked for an additional lot and the ZBA denied them. So they have two, basically, two back lots. Um, and the other, the only other item that came up that was a little bit different, definitely a bit, little bit different from the original uh, approval was the fact that they have two, two of those lots as accessing that easement that was originally expressed for one, one lot. So, but that's not, that's a, an easement issue between private property owners, not between the town. Uh, Ron, you, you got your hand up. I'm sorry if I have been ignoring you. Yeah, I guess this may be for Marsha. It, it says if there are two back lots, and I, I'm calling it a back lot because it, you know, it, it accesses from this neck. It says the ownership of the neck and the frontage have to be owned equally by the back lots. And right now it's a right of way, correct? No. Well, there is a right of way for access. There's a right of way for access. Um, and there is the, the, the two, the back lots themselves, their frontage is actually on the area that is very wet. So they're not taking their access from their frontage. They're right. taking it from the easement. So we want to be careful using the word back lot to not add confusion. It's yeah. just an, ir we'll use the word irregular shaped lot until we find better definitions. Um, Unusually long access. Those are yes, because it so, does have frontage. So if I understand this correctly, what you're saying is along Route 9, between the, the pens there that define L13, 14, and 15, that you own that strip all the way back to those lots. That's correct. And the only reason that you have this easement because you have the required frontage is because to be able to put a driveway in that doesn't cross the wetlands. Correct. So the wetlands on the frontage that exists are substantial um, and definitely standing water. So in the wisdom of both DES and the planning board the last time around, they created the 40 foot access easement uh, to go out back across the non wetland side. And so you're looking to do a subdivide that back piece into two lots, share the driveway. I will say I'm disappointed that uh, with the ZBA allowing, um, I mean, so close to the development to its right. Um, so, it's so, Mr. Chair? Yes. If I can comment on that, uh, please. Take a look at the topography. I, I would comment that I'm we're I think we're familiar with the topography and the lot through there. It's I mean, to make the access run right through the middle of that wetlands, it's it, it makes it nearly undevelopable 
with that wetland. So for the ZBA to allow that, I understand what Jamie's saying here. I mean, I just with the with the development going on on, on Dove development side to come through the backside, a potential connectivity for that giant piece is, is you know for the development of the town center is 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 realistic. I know it's steep in there. Um, and that's what I'm saying is is when you walk out there, uh, and even just looking at it on the on the plan, the the steepness of those slopes, with, and 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 also the the fact that it's it is out back. Uh, you know, it, it is just not, I mean, I've been doing real estate for 40 years. Um, I do commercial real estate. That will never be a commercial entity out there. Just, it just can't be. Yeah, the, probably the ledge removal would be years in the making to make that <laughs> even close to level. Yeah. It'll be a beautiful house site for somebody up top. Though. It will, it will. All right. Uh, well, then, um, what are the comments we had? Um, uh, we staff comments that there was some uh, access. There were some right. questions, Jamie. Originally, um, I spoke with the attorney um, because of the the discussion that originally it did say that it was. Uh, to be a single lot um, in the deed and everything, but the attorney assured me any question there was about a second lot off there was between the the property owners, and it was not, you know, it was uh, not the town of Barrington issue, so to speak, because it was an easement issue and not our our issue. So um, I got that I got that clarified. That's that's from an access easement issue, but from a ZBA yes. standpoint where they were granted a residential house out there, does that mean they could have, if someone was willing to upgrade the road and put in a development, they could have 50, you know, more now, without going back to ZBA? Actually, the ZBA denied them, one, they originally asked for two additional lots and the ZBA um, only allowed them one. So it's like, so it looks like a true, you know, pork lot, pork lot, pork back lot subdivision. Subdivision. yeah, back lot subdivision. Um, so it, it. So I, the Z, I mean, if the ZBA expressed one and now we're circumventing that somehow. No, 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 they, no, they no, originally no, said, they originally said one back in 2006, but they've gone back again, evidently asked for subdividing that twice and the ZBA said no you can have one additional lot back there and, and we keep using the term back lot but because they own this strip of land out to the road I, I'm, I'm not really sure this qualifies actually as a back lot no, no yeah. that makes that makes it a back lot it, it makes it, it a back lot yep yeah okay but either way you're right that it specifically says in the recent 2021 decision, it says residential use, town center, creation of, and they underlined it bold, uh, one additional lot. Parents, the request for two additional lots was denied. Correct. So we, we looked for three. Okay. And they took one away, so there are uh, now two. So the other one was already there. The other one's yep. already there. Gotcha. Um, all right. Um, so, no waivers, right? No, I I do. Um, Mr. Garvey really does need to look into, and I know it's only one additional driveway, but I don't even think they built any kind of driveway to any kind of standard for. Um, according to DOT, you know, so I, they do have a driveway standard when they do a driveway. So I, I you need to, to follow up with that for sure. Um, the other important things that have come up um, for uh, uh, talking with John Huckins is there is some concern with lot two um, because they're gonna have to, we're gonna have to have um, verification for that driveway that it meets the 10% grade the entire length. 
Yeah, actually, so, when I talked to the yeah. surveyor, he indicated that it's just under 10 for the entire length. There may be one spot where um, shaving the grade makes it go mm -hmm. below the, the point. So it's just it's a matter of looking at that one point. So. OK, that was I want. We just wanted to make sure we're, that we um, included that in any kind of notice of decision so that, you know, on your you're you're aware of that that's the condition yep. um but shouldn't that be some type of uh you know elevation showing that seeing as that's a concern shouldn't that be included in the application in the plans um not necessarily they're gonna we're gonna one of the requirements would be to have the engineer is going to have to verify it needs set so I know John looked at it quite extensively um, and there are, like I said, a couple of spots, but it will be a requirement and they will not get um, they will not get a, a occupancy for anything that um, doesn't meet that. Um, so what I've got in front of me, what action are we looking to take here, Marsha? I've um do you i mean i believe we could the, the board can accept it uh as complete that uh jamie i got a couple of comments yes ron please go ahead on sheet two there's a something that comes down it's a y it looks like an existing pathway I and can't hear him. Uh, he said on sheet two, there's there's a section that looks like a pathway coming down. Correct. Up and wise off. And there's, there's a wall. There's a wall. The yeah. And the reason I say I, I think because it's not in the legend. One of my pet peeves. And then it looks like there's a building uh, setback around the property line. And also that's not included in the legend. So I just like to see th every, all the symbols that are used in the drawing. I like to see them in the legend. The, uh, the dotted lines are two paths that currently exist. The one on the lower lot is one that is actually uh, looks like a fat bike trail that people are using. Uh, the upper one is uh, is not. It's an old woods road. Just you show it on the print and, it, and you don't know what it is because it's not in the legend. Okay. And then the site site the setback requirements that the symbol lines you use there are also not the legend. Um, if the board doesn't have any questions, um, I would like to get the application accepted as complete. Make a motion that we we accept this complete uh, application uh, two three nine dash one dot one dash tc dash twenty one dash two sub. Uh, I'll second that. Oh, we got a motion by Ron Allen and second by James Jennison. Um, Jeff Brand. Uh, <laughs> Bree and I, but I got a lot of issues with these plans. That's okay. We'll address those. Uh, <laughs> Andy Knapp. Um, the question is, do we have substantial enough information to accept the application, take it into our purview, and then discuss it more? Yeah, I'm... I think there's more stuff I actually need to look at, but I'm I'm struggling with the ZBA decision here, and I don't feel like I've looked hard enough into it to comment on it. I'm going to abstain. Uh, Ron Allard. 
Uh, James Chennis and I, Candace Kranz. Kranz I. Uh, Buddy Hackett. Hackett I. Uh, the application is accepted as complete. Um, now moving on to more and any questions that the board has. I know there must be some. some. Uh, Jeff, you got your hand up. Yeah. Okay. So if we go back to the subdivision regulations, what it says have to be on the plans. One of the things that I struggled with early is, you know, one of, one of the requirements is you got to have the existing conditions prior to doing any subdivision. So there is no sheet for that. And it should show like an, an overview of, you know, these properties as they exist today, and then move on to, here's what I want to do in the future. Uh, basically, you know, walking through the requirements that are in 5.3 of the subdivision regulations. And <clears throat> so, uh, have there been any test pits? I, I, I going back to Ron's complaint about the weapons, uh, which is also a frequent one of mine, so, have there been test pits that have been done? I assume yes. there. It looks like the symbols are there, uh, not in the legend, but uh, but they are on the drawing. So another deficiency in the legends. Uh, there's also, you know, so, okay. So that's part of it. Uh, the the driveway issues, ten percent. The the driveways. It shows the easement, but according to the requirements, the, the, the drive itself is supposed to be reflected on the drawings. Uh, any utilities going back there? I, I assume the places are not going to be off the grid. So there's a, there's a number of things. Uh, that are required to be on these drawings, including one that shows uh, existing conditions that aren't reflected in the prints. So you're just looking for a separate sheet with the existing conditions? Yes, there, there should be, but you, you ought to walk through what the requirements are in the regulations to ensure that uh, no, you you you've got all the details that are required. Yeah, I mean we can create another sheet. It's just, it's, all the conditions are on this. Uh, the existing conditions are on this plan, so that's fine. So, uh, no <clears throat> Sorry, I I'm sorry, I'm reading the ZBA. Any other questions? Um, well, I think you need to address, you know, uh, the <clears throat> the inspectors, you know, issues there showing us uh, that the grades for the drive, in addition to being added to the plans, that it's going to meet re the requirements. Uh, is there is John Hawkins around? I spoke I spoke with John and we that's why we added it to the plan. Remember, this is this isn't like a multi multiple family. This is right. this is adding a single lot. Yeah, no, um, I get it. Well, you know, I was I was going to ask, monumentation was on the uh, list. Yes, monumentation. I, I added monumentation to um, the list because obviously that's a, a requirement. Right. And so that hasn't been addressed on the plans? Yeah, that usually comes after. We uh, usually add that as a conditional of, of approval. Right. They'll add those. All right. What, what was he referring to about the uh, building neck? 
Oh, because the long, the long, narrow part, as you, it, you see the two lots, correct? Right. Yep. yep. So the long, narrow one, the, the narrow portion is not calculated into the area of the lot, which okay. obviously this is an enormous lot, so it's, it's not going to affect. And the, he did add the, the area. If you look at the, um, because he, yep. he provided a revised, because uh, he went through it, um, and he provided a revised. So there is the, uh, the, the upland and uh, the area coverage has been added? Yes, yes. Um, those, those were sent out recently. Does the plan design have a revision? Yeah, March please there be the four, uh, April 5th. Okay, so uh, we don't have the latest plans. Right. Mar Marsha, will, this, will there be a shared ownership down through the neck? Is that how this will be deeded? To okay. No. Okay, you've got it no, so they break off. How can it not be? It right our and that's part of our subdivision regulations in four point one point um four point one point three parents two, which is if there are two back lots, the ownership of the neck and frontage shall be owned equally by both back lots. It's a requirement of our subdivision. Um, then that can be made to happen. Um, we also needed to split the frontage equally, so uh, I guess that would just that would be a deed issue. There's also a permanent road agreement needs to be put in place for it as well. Okay. And recorded in the deed for each lot. Right, so that's why I say that's a deed issue. Where do uh, where do the Hayes come in? Prior owners of um, uh, what's the lot number? And that easement's been passed on to the Hendersons. The. If I'm correct, Hayes were the prior owners of tax map 239 lot one. That's going way back. Yeah. I just it just says on that driveway easement granted to Hayes. Yeah, there's several that go through the corner of those um, properties going way going going back. So they've kind of stayed on the the deeds. Um, I did add on, I had added about the common driveway maintenance agreement to be recorded at Stratford County Registry of Deeds um, in regard to the shared driveway. Yes, and that's, I included a copy of that in the, uh, in the package. Right, and I have it as number four on the draft. Notice the decision, which is definitely a work in pro progress, um, which also included the 10% grade requirement, maximum 10% grade of concern at, was um, lot um, 239, 1.3, one, uh, 1. Yeah, Marsh, I have a question kind of along those lines. If, if mm -hmm. this original easement right away easement, you know, was it was awarded to a one lot and you subdivided it. Do you need to revise that easement agreement so they both have access to it? So here's my here's my conversation I actually had um, with the attorney um, because one of the questions we had originally was about the for a single lot conversation that the the, the easement was for a single lot. Um, and she and she her the discussion was that that is between um, the property owners and it's not 
in the purview of the planning board. So what you're saying is that we can grant a subdivision, but they may not have access for the second lot if the property owners do not decide to grant access to that easement. Or if they fight it legally. Yeah, we've, we've, yeah. We've, already done, we've already had our attorney look at it as well. Um, I had the same questions. But it, is that... Is that smart for us to be creating a hardship for a neighbor? We legally don't have any authority to 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 stop that. It's up to the property owner. But we can ask for that language and agreement, can't we, before approval? We In what, be able what to. language? Well, that they have a, an easement language. <laughs> I don't think we can force we, that change. No, think, we know, can't. We can. We did put a. We put did put in that they have to have a maintenance agreement for the. Um, well, I, the I've driveway, been through. This, but. I've been through this easement before. Uh, I was working with some friends over in Newmarket under New Hampshire state law. You know, most of the easements, if you go read them. It, it's once the easement is granted to somebody, then they have the right to use that easement in, you know, whatever way they see fit. And so it, it's yep. <laughs> the fact that they they're using this and they're allowing somebody else on another lot. I'm not sure, at, at least from my dealings with this issue, that there's a lot of recourse for the person that initially granted these. I guess uh, it's not the town. I just yeah, that, can't. yeah, unfortunately, okay. you know, that's, you know, that. Well, fortunately, I mean, we don't. Have... I, and I will tell you when the ZBA went through this, it was a three to two vote. So if you, you asking questions and wondering is not unusual. I mean, I think that's part of the due diligence for any buyers of these lots. Okay. Yeah, some, I, you know, I, with respect to improvements on the easement, I, I know I, like I said, I, I recently went through this with friends of mine because they were all up in arms because there was an easement across their property that they bought that went up to a lot. And the people came in with bulldozers and leveled uh, the land, cut trees, so on and so forth. And, you know, they checked into all this and, and looked at it. And if somebody has an easement and wants to make improvements, I mean, it, it makes sense they would talk to the landowner. But basically, if that's what's necessary to provide access to whatever lands are serviced by that easement, uh, you know, there's, there's, it, it doesn't give you a whole lot of, of legal uh uh, reason to object unless it's you know it's doing something to affect the the value of your land now i'm looking at it from the other way jeff the, the concern is for the for the new buyers do they have access to the right of way the second lot if the easement was granted to one of the one of the lots and you create two lots or a, a different lot do they have access to the right of way and i would i would say no yeah no the answer is yes well, because, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that it's probably yes, because that e that easement goes through and into the neck there that is shared. So the easement is actually, you know, just to get from Route 9 out back to beyond the wetland area into the neck of the property. Now, you brought up a good issue, or, or Andy did, about that neck having to be shared and owned equally by the, the two back lots, which is another, another whole issue. But the easement is only to get from Route 9 back to that, that neck beyond the wetlands. So... Um... You've got we've got a list of comments um, from John Huggins and Marsha that need to be addressed. Correct? Um, are we looking to make any decision tonight, Marsha? We're not. I don't have a draft notice of decision or anything here, so I'm assuming that 
Um, I actually, well, I had a working no. one, and did you notice I had it up a moment ago? Let's see if I can do it or turn. It's a, it's, it, it's a bit of a skeleton, but I added something. So I'm gonna try this again. Hold on. Well, get, <laughs> given the number of issues that we have with the plans themselves, uh, at least one board member has ex expressed an interest in doing more research to try to understand you know what what's going on here and what the zba uh, decided uh i i don't know how we would proceed to vote on the application given the lack of information uh, that we have right now i think it's I, th I think folks that the the zba issue is very simple they created instead of one lot they they um basically allowed for a single family use in the town center district, which then allowed and they denied the ability to do three lots, which then allowed you allowed me to do two lots, not three. So the two lots are allowed use under the zoning. The use is what the ZBA allowed. I, I, I can appreciate Mr. Garvey's, Garvey's feedback on that. I just, I would feel much better with my time and effort reading the ZBA info on that and having conversations with the ZBA members to make sure I fully understand what they're, um, what they actually voted on in their intent. Uh, yeah, because like Andy says, the, the statement of one additional lot, two was denied, it, and if they they voted on zoning Ooh, of yeah. a residential use, but not number of lots. That's so. Um, Can I help I, you a little bit more with sure. it? I mean, I I I was at the meeting. I've done the site walk with them. I uh, actually dug into with the help of Barbara. We dug into a lot of. Um, the prior approval and um but the prior what, approval expired right right no action right it was more it was it was back in for you know it was just historical information okay. but what the zoning board voted on okay and it was a like i said a vote of three to two but that's what stands by the zba okay that's what they voted they voted one to allow for a residential use in the town center. Okay, they allowed for a residential use um, where it's not part of a planned unit development. They denied them having two additional lots. So that's where you end up with the traditional um, back lots. Okay, the two lots. So they legitimately have a right based upon their variance to create this additional law. I don't. Yeah. Well, <laughs> before we get, um, we accepted this as substantially complete. We've had some discussions here. Do we want to open it up for public comment? and then get beyond that and then we can finish this discussion sure well, let's do that do we have anybody here tonight that would like to ask a question or have a comment um star six to unmute your phone and raise your hand or just speak up if you have a question You know, there are, were some abutters there before, and, and they're not speaking. Hi there, it's Candace Harvey. Sorry about that. I was trying Hi, to unmute Candace. myself. Um, I, yes. I am I am 643 Franklin Pierce Highway. I am the original subdivision I imagine that you were referring to earlier. Um, I have the Leviso Salon and Spa. I know what I had to go through in order to get my business open there uh, with wetlands. Um, I have some questions about my rights with the more than one using the easement because it's my property that they're going through. Um, I just I have some questions about it because 
it's going it, to, because I just do, I guess. I don't know how to even address my questions, to be honest with you. Um, uh, just ask what you think you need to ask, and we'll guide you from I, there. All right. I have my fiance sitting beside me. It's Raymond Estes. I'm going to have him speak for me because I think he's a little more educated in the way that I have my questions. Is that okay? Sure. All right. Go ahead. So we're we're unclear um, in in the verbiage of uh, what what our actual rights are as far as more than one house lot using that right of way. Um, that is the original intent was for it to be used by one house, one house only. And. Correct. And that's, I guess that's what we're um, unclear on as to now they're going to create another lot out there. Does that mean that the other lot automatically gets um, the right to cross the property as well without us having any say in that? Uh, I believe that is... Uh one perspective um, from do you do you have a copy of that easement um we we have the copy of the easement um i don't have it in front of me though it came with our closings uh in our deed it would be important to go back and look at what the the language in that is i i don't think the board we we can hear your concern however uh as the town planner addressed earlier this is something that you are going to have to address as the owners with a lawyer because the board can't really address that that easement is a legal document that you that you signed or the previous owners signed giving access across the property that uh, i guess you you inherited when you when you bought the property so that's really a legal issue. I, 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 you may have heard me address earlier. I've seen easement language that's typical in the state of New Hampshire, that is usually relatively broad and non-specific. However, you know, I, I don't know what your easement says. You, you really should consult with a lawyer as to whether there are any restrictions on what it was granted, whether it only applied to one lot, or whether it's a more generalized easement. Yeah, Jeff, on this one, and I, and I don't want to get into the legal parts of it, that would be the question only because even on the plan, it specifically says for one lot, and then it specifically says for more than one, you would have to take your access from the frontage. So, I mean, but that's not an issue the planning board can deal with, but if the, the, property owner has concerns that's that's she needs to i would say talk with the applicant as well to have that conversation on what they sh what they should do if there's a concern what, what, the, uh, what you just said marcia where where is that that's on a plan it's on the older plan okay. back in uh, i mean I appreciate what you're saying, but that, I mean that draws concern for me. If I mean it, that's pretty specific. It's I know, not... I I know, but it's hard for I I had this conversation. I actually had it with the the the, the attorney, um, yeah. but it was because I have the older the older plan that specifically. Um, okay, so we should probably let the folks uh, finish up the public comment, and then mm -hmm. we can come back to this. Yep. Uh, Ms. Harvey, or yes. Ms. Estes, do you have any other questions or comments, concerns? It sounds like you have more than one. Uh, no, I guess not at this time. We'll uh, we'll just dis we'll discuss it um, with Mr. Garvey himself and and uh, um, see where we go from there. He's never reached out to us at all. The only thing we've ever heard about this is through you guys through certified letters. That's how we found out about what was going on. And, and that's not. Uh, you know that that's typical. Yeah, yeah. They they have access to that easement, and yeah. I, I wouldn't think there's anything nefarious going on. It's just you yeah. know. No, I didn't either. My, my yeah, main okay. concern is the traffic that's going to be going across the property that I I have developed into a nice tranquil salon and spa right. and 
that's my main concern. If, 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 if a house, one single family house goes there and they have three kids and they all have a car and the mom and dad have a car, there you go. You've got five cars coming and going three, four times a day. Yeah. I, I, and, that, and that's neither here nor there. I, I don't want to be a troubled neighbor and I certainly don't want to cause dissension between me and my potentially new neighbors. I'm a very friendly, kind person. I just, I have concerns that I want to make sure I have answers for. And now there is there is a driveway there currently. Not just some, mine. No. So that, okay. I was just reading on one that said the driveway, the curb cut is already in use. Nope. It's not in yes, use. It is there. The curb cut is there and it is in use. The credit union has, has actually um, designed plans using that entrance um, for their. Okay. So service. that's the corner of the U shape where the house was torn down. Correct. Okay, I get it now. I, yep. I, that's Harvey, not on my property, though, right? That is, technically. Oh, that, that was Sumner Hayes' old property, right? Yes. On yeah. the corner. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, I know what you're talking about. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's all thank right. You. Yep. All right. Um, any other public comments? Uh, hearing none, close public comment. Um, I think I would appreciate time to uh, write the draft notice of decision instead of on the spot, as we're currently trying to do. Um, I don't think it's prudent to do that with a few questions. Um, there's some additions that need to be done. Um, I, I don't want to delay, but at the same time, I don't want to, um, you know, put Marsha on the spot to, to, to write everything she can possibly think of right now and not miss something. I don't, I don't well, think it's a wise decision. Well, Jamie, I, I, I don't think Marsh is necessarily on the spot because I can tell you right now, given the deficiencies that are in the plans, I think now there's a new question is if <clears throat> what this would come down to is uh, given the language that Marsha was uh, using before, if in fact this easement was tied to access to one lot, there's going to be two. Well, then there's got to be an issue resolved. If, and I'm not suggesting it would be one way or the other, but if there, it was resolved that uh, the easement therefore is not applicable to be used by both lots, and then you have to go back to the regulations that there would have to be a driveway put through uh, the neck that's there with the actual frontage on the road, that opens up a whole new Pandora's box of issues with curb cuts, wetland areas. So I, I, I got to say that at this point in time, until you know we get adequate plans, these kinds of issues that are prepared to address, I, I know I wouldn't be in a position to be able to vote for approval of the subdivision tonight anyway. Yeah, I know. I was looking at it, Barbara. I was I'm trying to fit, fit my, um, find it in my stuff. That's, that, Thank Marcia, you. I, I have not seen any language like that in any of the plans. It, it's right on the it's right on the 2006 plan. I've got the plan right here. I've been reading it. Look in the small, look in the small, the, the notes. Uh, I've looked in all the notes. It's, it's <laughs> for the benefit. It was for the benefit of. Um, Oh, I gotta. I can't find it. Is it one point one? It was for the benefit of one point one. Well, Mr. Garvey, let me ask you: Were you looking for us to vote on this tonight? No, my assumption was is that we get through this and then uh, probably um, push this out to the twentieth for a decision. Yeah, I we think got, you. I think you need to talk the with the um, a butter, Dave. Is what I think you really yeah, need I'll, to do. I'll, I'll reach out to them tomorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Let's but it is quick. on the plan, the 2006 plan, um, that it is for one lot. Uh, Ron, you were trying to jump yeah, in there, please, Mr. Garvey. Uh, the frontage you have, what? How much frontage do you have? I I think you said that, but I missed it. Uh, I don't remember off the top. I think it's 100 and some odd feet. I did it right. I, I had it right here. Thank you. Um, and uh, another, that driveway be built to driveway standards? Yes. Okay. I, saw, I thought I saw someone utilizing existing driveway and widen where necessary, but. 
Well, uh, with respect to continuance to the 20th, that means that these plans would have to be revised, upgraded, and back to the planning office by the 14th of April in order to meet the deadline for the 20th of April. Is that a amount of time? That's correct. We've had actually uh, most of the corrections were made on the additional set that was supplied. It was a miscommunication while Marsha was out. Um, we had them done like within three, four days uh, of uh, when Barbara sent me the, the email. So. Dave, most I of will it, tell most you, of it I will tell you. Just received this stuff yesterday. Yeah. yeah. There was no That's communication. We talked to you, John and I talked to you, and you asked if this could be on the final plan, and we said yes. And then all of a sudden, plan showed up yesterday. Right. And um, I think our conversation was to wait to submit till after we got through the first meeting. So that that, that was my impression when I left. Right. So um, do we have any more questions before we look for a motion to continue? Is there anything specific we're we're looking to address? That that I guess that would be my question. Uh, driveway point, grade. I think Andy's point is that it's got to be dual ownership. It's got to be ownership of the frontage and the neck. Yeah, I'll yeah. I'll I'll take care of that with. Um, uh, I'll talk to the attorney about the deed. And, 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 you know, they've got to go through the requirements for what's required on the plans that are in the subdivision regulations. I mean, we could just start listing them off one after another, but they just need to go through and, and upgrade the plans. And maybe that's already been done. I don't know because it, it we is. haven't seen the final plans, but I would suggest they go back and look at the requirements to make sure that it meets the requirements yep. for the next time. Yep. We've been through... Uh... Been through it twice since then, so. Okay, very good. So, yeah, I mean, because typically we see like a building envelope and a, a place correct. for they a had, yeah, those septic ones design, had you know, that fits on the property. I know they're substantial, so, but uh, Andy, I'm sorry. Um, I was just going to ask between you and Marsha, I know one of the things that we, we typically do when we're talking about um, class six or private road agreements is that we we make that one of the conditions of approval and um so is there a, would this be something where we would look at part of the condition of approval is that they have a consensus for being there they have a they have a consensus to have a two lot approval for travel in there since one lot is what's actually approved so no, typically what you have is the the um, road maintenance agreement because this isn't really technically although it's going to be a shared road that's part of the well, it's, a driveway. it's a driveway shared driveway, shared, right. shared yeah. driveway. same thing yeah. Yeah. And, and i submitted a shared driveway maintenance agreement no i saw that there, there were some things that got pulled up. Unfortunately, I think it was a little bit hastily put together. So it, it just, um, there are some bits and pieces that have come in, but not, I guess, organized enough. So. Well, that's okay. We'll take a look at it as, as it comes in. Um, I guess just uh, having that added information will help clarify some things um, and give us some time. To review them so um and, and, the, and the abutter also the the property owners yeah i think that's a critical part yeah and you know just knowing how much frontage doesn't meet the requirements of the regulation you know frontage in general or, or if that's not sufficient you know i can't well, tell from what i'm looking at well you got to remember that for a back lot okay which it's not you only need 50 which it, you only you only need 50 feet of frontage, so they're in excess of that. Well, but it's not the, a back lot. It is a back mm -hmm. lot. They're just taking their access from an easement. So the the. But the the contention is that it is a it has the frontage to be a regular lot. It's just an irregular shaped regular lot that happens to be behind another lot. But the, he he stated it's that we have enough. Lot. He's a stated it's that there's a, enough frontage. 
there's, uh, there's enough frontage for a back lot subdivision as the requirements for the, the town state. Which is a minimum of 50 feet. So you can have more than 50 feet. Well, but uh, so, Marshall, town but, center only requires 40 feet of frontage. The, the town center is what they got a variance from. And that was about the usage. So it's not, it's a, that was a different, different, different issue altogether. But, no, but, saying, saying saying requirement for town center. but we're seeing we're given a back lot. We're using back lot parameters for 40 feet, minimum 40 feet. No, the 50 40 feet, feet is the easement. No, okay. But you said a back lot frontage is 50 feet. Correct. A minimum. But we're doing a, a minimum. two lot back lot. So it's, so you, you can have two back lots, okay, on 50 feet. Okay. But they don't have 50 feet. Yes, they do because they, you're they, looking at the easement, not right. the ownership of the. Yeah. I agree, I but know, they're not. Totally. totally it's, I agree, but they're not using the actual owned land. They're using the easement, which is a 40 foot approved um taking access. Only, access. access it's just an easement it's not ownership and i know it i know it's hard and i know that's what the zoning board granted them it's it, it's complicated but, it's complicated. but when i look at it like one of the things we're looking at here is a is to we shouldn't be making something more non-conforming throughout the process the zoning board did this we have no but the zoning board the zoning board didn't subdivide it they just allowed access to it no our process here is no. deeming that the, the access, zoning board allowed residential use without a pud right they, they didn't subdivide one, no and they also gave them the additional lot this is so where now I, they just yeah it i think we all everybody probably needs to spend a little time looking at what the zoning board actually okayed how it's written and how this was originally set up marcia because i'm yes. struggling with it mr chair may I, may I make a suggestion sure yes maybe marcia and i can sit down and write something down for the board that will lay out the parameters of all of the steps that have been taken and the results of each step that would logically guide you through the pieces. And if they could reference how they, oops, we had a little glitch there. And if they could reference how they meet our regulations would be the pertinent, the most important piece for everybody to, to, to kind of settle it because I think we're back lot, not back lot, regular lot, you know, subdivision, it's it's become taking access from a right away and not your frontage, you know, so that's that those are the um, I think there's a lot of words being used in 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 terms thrown around that aren't relevant or are and used improperly or and, and then the, the whole zoning board piece. I mean, it says what they did in 06 grant use, but the one I mean, in big capital letters one. I don't know if that's one meaning the one <laughs> or one meaning one additional one. It says one additional, Jamie. To additional to what though? The original Harvey lot that was subdivided yeah. off yeah. years before? Yes. But I have that's a couple of like, questions, you know, along the lines you're talking about, Jamie. I mean, I've heard, uh, Marsha, I've heard you say, call it a back lot and then say it's not a back lot. So I'm still confused on that one. No, it's, um, a, it's a back lot. And also, <laughs> I'm, I'm confused is yeah. I don't understand how the ZBA can approve a subdivision. I think they can approve the use of residential, but I don't think their authority extends to the actual approval of subdivision. They're not approving the su subdivision. By saying they get an additional law, they that's de facto a zoning are. issue. Yeah, that's a zoning issue. They're additional the lots. Use, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're saying a residential use of that, but it doesn't mm -hmm. mean they are necessarily approving the subdivision into two lots, in my mind. Well, they gave them the lot because that's what they needed, but the other parts of the the um, subdivision regulations themselves need to be adhered to. Need to be adhered here to. Okay. All right. How about a motion to continue to the twentieth? Okay. 
<laughs> you want to, you, you have more questions, Andy? You'd I make a motion to no, continue. Yeah. Motion because I abstain from even. I voting. make a motion to continue. I make a motion to continue application 239-1.1-TC-21-2 sub to 20 April 2021. Second. Motion by Jeff Brand, second by Ron Allard, uh, James Jennison, I, Jeff Brand. Brand, I. Andy Knapp. Um, I, because, I mean, it's not going to matter. My prior vote was already... Passed. Thank you. Ron Allard. Allard, I. Candace Kranz. Kranz, I. Buddy Hackett. Hackett, I. Uh, motion carries. Continue to the uh, April 20th meeting. All right, Mr. Garvey, thank you very much for your time. Right. And we'll Marcia, see you. I will get with you tomorrow. We'll figure out a time to sit down and try to uh, make that a logical uh, uh, sequence for the board. Very I'll do good. My best. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Reports from other committees and unfinished business. Nothing. Um, there's other boards have voted on um, their their seats, uh, chair and vice chair. We were kind of waiting till in person. Um, I don't know um, where we stand on that and what we want to do. Um, Marsh, you feel as though we should have a vote um, for for assignments. I, I, I it, that's up to the board. I'm not. We, we were trying to find, you know. Legally, if you have to do it in person or not, I don't know. Um, Andy, um, sorry, Andy, maybe you have some insight. You got your hand up. Yeah, I was going to make a motion for Jamie Jennison to continue as the chair of the planning board. And I, I add that uh, Jeff be uh, continue as vice chair. I will second Ron's motion. Ron's, ad Ron's addendum to your motion. <laughs> oh, it's just an addendum to my motion. Okay. We we need a second on Andy's motion. Second. Motion by Andy Knapp, seconded by Ron Allard. We'll do a roll call vote. Uh, James Jennison, aye. Jeff Brand. Brand, aye. Andy Knapp. Aye. Ron Allard. Allard, aye. Candace Kranz. Kranz, aye. Buddy Hackett. Hackett, aye. Vote carries. Uh, thank you for your confidence in me. I, when COVID is over, we meet in person. We can talk about it again. Um, is there anything else uh, we need comment. to address? I, I thought the uh, I was more impressed with the Dubois and King's comments on these last few uh, applications. I think they've done. A, a you know, it's funny you mentioned that, Ron, because I thought the last comments were better. I wonder if that's because <laughs> they they know we're in the middle of. Uh, Throwing them off it the around. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jeff, you're so cynical. That could not be the case. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next meeting is April 20th. Same time, same place. Hey, uh, uh, before we meeting. adjourn, do you think we ought to address the minutes of the last meeting? Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. I'm trying to go home and I put them, buried them somewhere in the pile. You're right. Uh, oh, here they are. Does anybody have questions, comments, corrections about uh, the meetings for March 2nd minutes? I have none. I have none. Um, hearing none, we'll do a vote for those members that were here. Uh, James Jennison approved. Jeff Brand. Brand, I. Um, Andy Knapp. Abstain. I wasn't, wasn't proud. Present. Um, so that's right. It says that. And Ron, you are not present as well. The power hours got me out. Yep. Um, and um, well, this is interesting. You can, you can vote even though you um, abstain. Just don't change the minute. Okay. Candace Kranz. Kranz, I then. Buddy Hackett. Hackett, I. Minutes are as proved as written. Uh, I, right. I will point out that even if you aren't at a meeting, 
if you go back to what our rules of procedure are, it, you're, you're supposed to go back and review the minutes to catch you up for, on the meeting that you missed. So yes. everybody, everybody should still read the minutes. I, I, will point I out read them. I yes, just I did. Yeah, I read them. I just wasn't comfortable voting on them because I wasn't present at the meeting to validate anything that's been said. Fair enough. All right. Uh, a motion to adjourn until April 20th. I make a motion to adjourn until April 20th. Second. Motion by Jeff Brand, second by Andy Knapp. James Jennison, aye. Jeff Brand. Brand, aye. Uh, Andy Knapp. Aye. Ron Allard. Two thumbs up. Candace Kranz. Kranz, aye. Buddy Hackett. Hackett, aye. Thank you all for coming. Nice meeting you both. Look forward to seeing you in a couple Bye -bye. weeks.